uh, I think before I, we, we talked on the phone, but I hadn't read the book yet. And I haven't read it all now, but I am looking forward very much to finishing it. Uh, I'm supposed to be working on my own book, and my editor is coming tomorrow morning, and I won't tell her, but as soon as she leaves on that day, I'm, I'm going to turn away from my book and finish reading it. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. I uh, can't stop reading it, and it's very well written. And the reason I'm here tonight really is that I knew, came to know Bobby Kennedy, in, the, in particular in the last year of his life. I'm 85 now. I was 30, 1960, I was 37 uh, when he died. And you were in your teens, I understand. And did you actually ever meet Bobby Kennedy? Because this is a book that, that reels very good understanding of the Bobby I knew, it, and most of it, which I didn't know about the earlier years. I first met him in 64. Later I said I came to know him in 67, 68. But uh, uh, from everything that I do know and of that period, it's very, very true to the period and very true to Bobby Kennedy. And I don't, Bobby was a complicated character who did change, as a matter of fact, who'd gotten a lot of enemies, some of whom, you know, were very much to his credit. Uh, that he had uh, enraged uh, Jimmy Hoffa and a lot of others. But he also enraged a lot of people uh, throughout his life. And, and uh, was known as abrasive, ruthless, uh, and uh, uh, had, had qualities that had not endured him to a lot of people. And I should say that when I first met him in 64, I was doing a very highly classified study of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I wanted to see him because of his role in that. And I've gotten uh, many serious questions about what had gone on in the Cuban Missile, and in, I should say, and in Vietnam. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry, uh, later it was in 67 that I saw him again, and I was interested in Vietnam. But in 64 I was asking about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I can say he did not give a good impression on me as a person at that time. Uh, he was in the Attorney General's office. Uh, where I met him, I talked to him for about an hour, and he told me actually some very significant things, that some of which have never really come out, and I'll be I'll be talking about them in this, this book that I'm working on. But um, uh, he seemed very unsure of himself, very young, uh, very. Uh, <laughs> I'll show you one thing that made a, a peculiar impression on me. Uh, he said at one point, the Cuban Missile Crisis being in October of 1962. And I'm now talking to him in the spring of 1964, just a couple of years later. And at one point he says, about October 62, now something else was going on at that time. By the way, he was, it was understood that he was interested in being Secretary of State at that point. Uh, Lyndon Johnson wasn't about to do that, but the word had been in the paper that he was interested in being Secretary of State. And um, so he said, something else was going on at that time. Much. And by the way, I've, I've never figured out exactly what he might have had in mind. But he was thinking about it, he tapped the truth and said, when was Vienna, the Vienna summit? I said, well, that was the spring of 1961. It's a year and a half earlier. And I said, yeah, yeah. And he went on. I thought, this guy wants to be Secretary of State. Not in the summit, I'm like, yeah. Because later when I got in the government, I understood something that is impossible to understand beforehand. When you really are operating in the government, it is very taxing to remember what happened three days or you know, a week ago. That's the truth of it. Uh, but he did not, as they say, make a really strong impression on me. And uh, although in some ways he, he already showed quite a bit of humor, a certain point, a dry humor. Okay, three years go by. I've been in Vietnam then for two years, come back to hepatitis, and I believe we should get out. But I had also been working on this study of the Pentagon Papers and uh, uh, had, had arrived at very puzzling things about how uh, we can talk about, about his brother, Jack, and their policies at that time. But the reason I'm saying this now is he now made a totally different impression on me. Uh, we actually met when we were both speaking to a gathering, a national gathering of CBS executives from all over the country. And I gave my pitch, I had just come back from Vietnam, about the ineradicable stalemate we were in, the need to get out, you know, the, uh, the impossible. But when he spoke, and he was the first person I'd met in Washington who not only had the picture of the need and why we needed to be getting out, but seemed to have a 
passion about it and an emotion and a commitment. I really hadn't encountered that. It was not at all hard to find people who had been in Vietnam or who were in Washington in 67 now, before the Tet Offensive, but who knew we need to get out of there. We're stuck. It's a stalemate. It's six months before Walter Cronkite says after the Tet Offensive, we are in a stalemate and we must negotiate out. But at this point, it was well known within the government, but not at all outside. And I think this is the first person I've heard who seems really committed on this issue and to have a, have a, have a passion about it. Well, I'll sum up this point that I wanted to introduce you by just saying, I then, uh, he came back with me, we went to his office after we'd spoken to CBS, because he wanted to ask me more questions, and we, we had very, very interesting uh, exchange then. And ultimately, in the spring of 68, uh, for reasons we may go into if we have time later, I began to see him uh, for a period almost every day, every other day or so. So a lot of uh, at his home and had dinner. He was the, so as I say, Larry has brought out then, this person who had changed unmistakably. He was now a different person. His brother had died. His father was incapacitated. He had run for the Senate now and won in the Senate. He was his own man, and he, he just seemed an entirely different person, and one that I had not met in Washington in many years that I've been there by that time, and never have again since. And actually, he asked me uh, later, uh, a little bit later, in the spring of 68, to be his man on Vietnam, and to leave the Rand Corporation where I was, and work for him, gathering all the information in Vietnam for his speeches, and press conferences and you know, in policy line on Vietnam. And I wasn't prepared to do that at that point uh, because I wanted to be free to speak to all the candidates and see if I could get a convergence of opinion. I was understood at that time to be somebody who knew the situation in Vietnam very well. And, been there. and they were virtually all willing to talk to me or the representatives. And so I didn't want to be connected with just one person. I wanted to see them. So I turned that down, but I did talked to him frequently, and went with him. He was my man, of course, uh, the one I wanted to see then. And I went to rallies, and I saw the way people reacted to him, so forth. And just to sum up, as I say, and I think Larry brings this out very well, showing the ways in which his earlier traits persisted, and so it's not in my dealings with him, my dealings, but I've heard it. Uh, he wasn't, you know, an entirely different person. But he was very different, as I've said, from the way he had been earlier and from everybody else in political life I've ever met. And at that point, I had the impression that he was the person who could heal these chasms, these cataclysmic rifts in our society. Uh, remember, 68, long, almost 40 years ago now, uh, we're, we're, we're in a racist campaign right now. Race is at the top. After eight years of an Afro-American president, uh, race has never been. Well, Bobby Kennedy was clearly the person, as a white man and a politician, Catholic, who had the ability to not only talk to the blacks, but at the same time appeal to the white uh, Appalachians, the blue collar workers that Trump is making a racist appeal to. It. Who else you know, could bridge that? So I thought, he's, and he was clearly going to get us out of Vietnam. The war had seven years to go at that point, and had he lived, and had he been president, which is a big if, but the real possibility, I believe we would have shaved seven years off that 30-year war. Mm -hmm. So Vietnam, America, but this is the man who can transform, who can save our country. He was the only politician I've met that I believed had that transformative bridging and unifying capability. And he was the only politician, and I wasn't wrong about that. And he was the only politician I ever loved. And I didn't know that, what I felt about him, until he died, until the morning he died. And I cried for half an hour, and I realized that what had died within me was a sense that this country could change or be changed. I had at that point a vision. Perhaps there is no way to change this country. And that wasn't uh, an excessive reaction at that point. And I also realized that I had uh, that I loved it at that point, which I wouldn't have said 
a week earlier. And that's never left me. And I think he was worthy of it. Well, I think this book will convey better than anything I've seen uh, that.